Well, today as we're less than a week away from the Christian Passover, I have a, a message about the brotherhood of the children of God, something that we should think about, reflect on, and meditate on. If you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1, Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews, probably written, you know, most scholars, well, a lot of scholars think it was written by the Apostle Paul. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1, and I'm going to cite the Amplified Bible version. For this reason, that is, because of God's final revelation in his son Jesus, and because of Jesus' superiority to the angels, you know, you know breaking into the logic the author of Hebrews at this point in Hebrews 2 verse 1. For this reason, we must pay much closer attention than ever to the things we have heard, so that we do not in any way drift from the truth. You know, this passage is most certainly fitting as a pre-Passover Christian meditation for the God's called out ones. His ecclesia is ecclesia, the church of God. You know, because we we must. This is an exhortation. To, you know, pay closer attention to what we have heard. We must not be forgetful hearers. We must be ready to put our nose in the Bible, and think about the gospel message. To think about what the apostles had to say, what the prophets had to say, what Moses had to say at this time of year. For this reason, we must pay much closer attention than ever to the things we have heard so that we do not drift away from the truth. For if the message given through angels, that is, the divine messengers who spoke for God the Father, giving the law to Moses, the word of prophecy to the prophets, and divine inspiration to the rest of the writers, the, the gospel as Jesus preached it, because he said, you know what I speak? I'm not speaking of myself, I'm speaking of the Father. For the message given through these messengers of God was authentic and unalterable, and every violation and disobedient act received an appropriate penalty. How shall we escape? How are we going to escape the penalty if we ignore such a great salvation? If we ignore the gospel, if we ignore the, the new covenant that we have made with God the Father, if we downgrade it, if we say, oh, well, it's not important to, you know, this, that, and the other, we find excuses to do other things. I got business meetings, this, you know, and all this, or whatever it might be. Do you allow, are you letting the world crowd out the problems, the cares of this world? Is, is, is you know, are, we, are you letting these things crowd out our attention? To the most important relationship that we have? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24. I'm going to read this in the New Living Translation. Again, I believe it was Paul who was writing. Anyways, Paul says to us in Hebrews 10, 24, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. In the brotherhood, we should be thinking of ways to motivate each other to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. We have a role in the brotherhood of fellowship and of encouraging one another. It's important that we do this. Now, there is a simple guide for brotherly behavior that the gospel that Jesus gave, actually, and something we should reflect on in this pre-Passover time. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1. And I'm going to cite this in the message. It's more of a paraphrase than a translation, but he, I, I like the way he put it here. This is Matthew 7 and verse 1. Don't pick on people, Jesus said. <clears throat> Jump on their failures, criticize their faults, unless, of course, you want the same treatment. Doesn't that sound, <laughs> you know, do us to others as you'd have them do unto you? The critical spirit has a way of boomeranging. 
it's easy to see the smudge <laughs> on your neighbor's face and be oblivious to the ugly sneer on your own. Do you have the nerve to say, let me wash your face for you when your own face is distorted by contempt? It's this whole traveling roadshow mentality all over again, playing a holier-than-thou part instead of just living your part. As a brother who's trying to encourage one another, trying to motivate to love and good works. And, you know, it ends this section here in Peterson's uh, message. Uh, wipe that ugly sneer off your face and you might be fit to offer a washer cloth to your neighbor. So it's something when we're working with people, we have to consider ourselves. It's extremely important. Yeah, other people have needs. They have areas to grow and Sure they do. We all do. But we have to consider ourselves and we have to consider how we do these things so that we do it in a way that is pleasing. You know, Think of ways, Hebrews 10, 24. Think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. This is an important thing. Do we do this in our congregations with one another? Paul has something else to say, and you know it, 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 really, it, it fits with Hebrews very closely. Let's go to Galatians 5 and verse 14. I, I can see you know the, the fingerprints, if you want to say it, of the same author of here of Hebrews and Galatians. Anyways, Galatians 5 and verse 14 in the Amplified Bible Version. For the whole law, that is, the whole law concerning human relationships, is filled, fulfilled in one precept, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That is, you shall have an unselfish concern for others and do things for their benefit. You're looking out for their best interests. When you do things, do we have this attitude? something really to consider as we approach the Passover. For the whole law is fulfilled in one concept, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 15, but if you bite and devour one another, you know, what visual language, <laughs> bite and devour, you know, it's, very, this is, it's a very powerful metaphor that Paul is using. But if you bite and devour one another, obviously using your tongue for bickering and strife, watch out that you, and along with your whole fellowship, your family, whatever it is, are not consumed by one another. You know, if we take a negative spirit, a, a critical spirit with one another, I, I <laughs> my maternal grandmother was very much like that <laughs> growing up. It made life miserable. It made her life of her husband miserable. It made the life of her daughter miserable. It made the life of her grandkids when my parents were divorced, you know, miserable. I mean, we lived in the house. It was the kind of place where, this, where my grandmother, you know, she had white couches covered in plastic. And we had to, you know, it's like we were walking on eggshells all the time because she had a critical spirit. She could point out all of our faults, whatever we did wrong or did, it did you know, didn't do exactly up to stay her standards. She'd give us rats. It was tough. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Now she made her the life of her family, she, you know, sucked the life out of it. Verse 16, but I say walk habitually in the spirit. And the, you know, we walk habitually as the spirit motivates us and guides us, being responsive to the spirit's guidance. And then you will certainly not carry out the desire of the sinful nature. The sinful nature, which, as Amplified notes, which responds impulsively without regard to God, his precepts, his law, his teachings. You know, this whole way of how we're approaching our labor, have a you know, neighbor having unselfish concern for doing things that are that are good for them, you know, motivating them and trying to encourage them to do that which is good and pleasing in God's sight. Well, back to Hebrews ten twenty six, dear friends. If we deliberately continue sh sinning after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. 
This is a very controversial scripture. Because there are many people, you know, there's a whole segment of traditional Christianity say, once saved, always saved. You know, you can never lose yourself. But this is not what it says. <laughs> but then, you know, there are a lot of traditional Christianity doesn't follow, you know, what the Bible says. You know I mean, they, they have their human traditions, you know, Good Friday, Easter Sunday. None of these things square with the scriptures. You can check our website. We have a number of posted messages about these things this time of year. So it says, if we deliberately continue in sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. That's deliberately. We're going to set ourselves to do what is wrong. Ignoring God. Because it's to our benefit, financial or personal, whatever it might be. And then, you know, that's, that gets us in hot water. Verse 27 there is only the terrible expectation of God's judgment and raging fire that will consume his enemies. We can't make ourselves God's enemies. He's, he's, he's our father. We have to be willing to, to listen to, to have a, you know, a, you know, to be sensitive, to respond to his urgings, his corrections, his teachings. Not that we're going to do it perfectly. By no means, you know, no, no parent expects their kids, you know, you know, after they mess up one time to never mess up again. That would be silly. You know, we live in a constant state of showing grace. You know, and children show this love for their parents. None of us, you know, are perfect. If you've ever had kids, you know, you know, the parents aren't perfect, the kids aren't perfect, but we learn to, to, to care for and love each other and to, to work to doing and saying what is to the benefit of one another. Hebrews 10, 28. For anyone who refused to obey the law of Moses was put to death without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Just think how much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled on the Son of God and have treated the blood of the covenant which made us holy as if it were common and unholy and have scorned the spirit of grace. See, we're, sanctu we're coming up here. We're, we're, it's a world we're memorializing this renewal of our covenant with our, with our Lord and Savior. You know, his, we don't want to trample on his, treat his blood, the blood that he shed, which, was, the, which re was required for the making of the new covenant. You know, it's something that's common or unholy. It sanctifies it. We're committed. Verse 30. For we know the one who has said... I will take revenge. I will pay them back. He also said the Lord will judge his own people. The judgment does begin with the household of God. It is a terrible thing to fall in the hands of the living God. Think back on those days when you first learned about Christ. Remember how you remained faithful, even though it meant terrible suffering. All that period of time in the first century, when the church was being formed, you know, the, the mainstream Jewish community, you know, the leaders of them were really on their case. You know, they, they killed some of the, uh, one of the apostles. They killed Stephen. They persecuted them. Sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule and were beaten. And sometimes you helped others who had suffered the same things. You suffered along with those who were thrown into jail. When all you owned was taken from you, you accepted it with joy. You knew there were better things waiting for you that will last forever. So Paul, so Paul was writing here he very, uh, the experience of what the church went through there in the first century. So do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. See, Paul's writing about 30 years after the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ. And the church went through lots of things and society was going increasingly hostile. And you had all these soaring things going on because you had the zealots who wanted to rebel against Rome. You, you had the Sadducees and the others who wanted to continue to collaborate. Rome. The, the political machinations and forces were incredible. The Apostle James, who wrote the book of James, he wasn't going to go along with it, and he was eventually murdered because of, you know, he said, no, 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 our Lord and Savior is Christ. We're looking for, for this, you know. Church went through a lot in the first century. So 
So do not throw away the confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings to you. God has lots of promises he's made to us that he's going to give us the kingdom of God. He's going to give us life inherent within ourselves. We'll never get tired. We'll never get weary. All of our, our bodily weaknesses, our infirmities and things, things will just drop away from us. Patient, verse 36, patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will see receive all that he has promised. You know, Revela book of Revelation says be faithful unto death. We have to be faithful through our last breath. Whatever it is we go through, patient endurance Verse 37, for in just a little while, the coming one will come and will not delay. And my righteous ones will live by faith. You know, faith is our belief in, you know, that what God is there. He's with us. He hasn't abandoned us. For all the things we go through, just like the brother in the first century who went through, you know, you read this scripture, they went through a lot. And we are going through a lot. But we'll go through more. Verse 39, But we are not like those who turn away from God to their own destructions. We are the faithful ones whose souls will be saved. So let's go back to Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3. Picking up, you know, it's, it's along this theme. How will we escape the penalty if we ignore such great salvation? You know, if we ignore the gospel, if we ignore our commitments to the new covenant. For it was spoken by, first by the Lord and was confirmed to us and proven authentic by those who personally heard him speak. See, this is what the gospels and the book of Acts and the writings of the apostle Paul, these people had direct experience with our Lord Jesus Christ. And besides the, uh, besides the evidence, <laughs> the testimony, the scriptures, and then we have the accounts that God also testifying with them. That is, confirming the message of salvation by both signs and wonders and various miracles. These things carried out by Jesus. The proof that of his Messiahship, the, the things that he did that were so remarkable, the raising of Lazarus, that the, you know, that they led to his murder because the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious established, realized if they didn't kill him, everybody was going to believe on him because of these incredible signs. And then the, the signs that the uh, apostles did when they started preaching, or preaching there right in the temple, and they arrested them. But, they, but the time when they arrested Peter and John, they had this fellow who had been lame from birth, and they, you know, God had healed him through them. And in the, the religious establishment, these guys were sitting there, well, what can we say? We can't speak against this because everybody knows this guy. He's been out there for he was long suffering for most of it, well, all of his life, he was, because he was born lame. How old was he? 30, 40, 50? Had he been suffering 30, 40, 50 years for this time when God had actually had him there? And he'd been begging all this time, you know, the public humiliation for all this time to try to make a living begging at the beautiful gate. All this time, God had it there because he was going to heal him in a powerful way to prove to people the authentic message that the apostles were teaching. You know, when, when the establishment was trying to cancel them out, metaphorically and physically, So how will we escape the penalty if we ignore such great salvation? For it was spoken at first by the Lord and was confirmed to us and proved an authentic by those who personally heard him speak, both by signs and wonders. God also testified to these things and various miracles. And by granting to the believers the gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. The church learned 
the authentic, the real nature of God and the message they heard because of what they were given by God. Let's go to First Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 4. Confirmed by the gifts of the Holy Spirit according to God's own will. Paul says here, There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it's the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. See, the purpose of these gifts are to help each other and help people in the world. That's why God gives us these gifts. To one person, God gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another, and to someone else, the Spirit gives the gift of healing. To which, you know, we know the a fruit of the Spirit is patience and kindness and long-suffering. 10, verse 10, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 10. The Spirit gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. It gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. <laughs> and the source is elsewhere. <laughs> Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages while another the ability to interpret what is being said. Otherwise... You know, you have to have both. <laughs> Otherwise, it's unprofitable for the church. Verse 11, But the one and same Spirit is operating in all these things, dividing separately to each one as God himself desires. God treats us as individuals. Let's go to John fifteen six. God treats us as individuals. He takes a personal interest in you. See, you yourselves, Jesus said to the disciples, he said, you yourselves did not choose me, but I have personally chosen you and ordained you, that's commissioned you, that you should go forth and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. And then he said, so that, you know, while you're doing this, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you those things you do to bear fruit. You ask and he will do these things. This is a promise, he says. You know, he's ordained us. He's given us specific gifts to exercise. And we use these things. These things I command you, that you love one another. Again, that's the overarching process of the brotherhood. The brethren, we are to love one another, to look out for each other's best interests. Verse 18, if the world, now this is interesting, the Greek word here is cosmos, which is Strong's 2889. That's cosmos. It's properly an ordered system. It's the system. The organization. The culture. Which includes the governments and the, you know, the MSM and Big Pharma. Everything these days that we have in the system. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. However, because you are not of the world, but I have personally chosen you out of this system. The system hates you for this. We're not part of the system. No, we can't comply. Let's go back to Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2. You know, this idea of the cosmos, the ordered system, there's another word that's being used here, too. We're going to see this in Hebrews 2 and verse 5. It was not to angels that God subjected the world. The world. Here, the word is oikomeni. It is strong 3625. It's the whole cultural organization of the world. It, 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 the, the lexicon defines it as the land that is being inhabited, the land or state of inhabitation. It is oikomeni, of course, is a Greek word, and the, the Greeks used to think it, that was of the Hellenistic area, the Greek speaking area was the oikomeni. 
<laughs> but when the Greeks got conquered by the Romans, they said, okay, it's all the Roman Empire. You know, we have the Roman Empire. That's the Oikomeni, and we're outside the borders of the Roman Empire where the barbarians live. Uh, they don't count, you know. These things I say to you, if you love <laughs> to love one another, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world loved its own. However, because you are not of the world, but I have personally chosen you out of the world. The world hates you for this. Yeah. So it was Hebrews 2 and verse 5. It was not to the angels that he subjected the, that, uh, subjected the world, the oikomeni, the inhabited world of uh, the future. That is when the time when the kingdom of God comes, when Christ reigns, about which we were speaking. But one has only testified somewhere in Scripture, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you graciously care for him? You have made him a little while lower in status than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet, confirming his supremacy. But in putting all things in subjection to man, he left nothing out of his control. But at present, Apostle said, but at present, we do not yet see all things subjected to him. And that's a good thing. <laughs> You know, with all the genetic manipulation and, you know, and all the incredible inventiveness of man to make weapons of mass destruction and, you know, when they manipulate physics and the laws of chemistry and all this stuff, there's good things that we don't see everything subjected to man. Nine, but we do see Jesus, who is made lower than the angels for a little while, you know, because he took on the limitations of being human, crowned with glory and honor because of his suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, you know, which was extended to sinners, he might experience death for the sins of everyone. For it was fitting for God, you know, an act worthy of his divine nature, his holiness, his righteousness, that he for whose sake are all things and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the author and founder, or as the King James say, the captain of their salvation, the pioneer, our champion of salvation, perfect through suffering. It's an amazing thought to think about. That Jesus Christ, who was the Word, who had inhabited eternity, he was perfected through suffering as a human being. You know, this would bring him to maturity. His, to, to bring Christ to spiritual maturity, you know, he had to have that experience of human suffering so that he would be perfectly equipped to fulfill his role, his prophesied role of being the high priest to all humanity, the one who makes intervention with God the Father, brings us into our relationships, brings us, you know, forgiveness. Verse 11, both Jesus who sanctifies and those who are sanctified when we talk about sanctification, you know, that's a good religious word, but it's, you know, it's being spiritually transformed, being made holy, being set apart for God's purpose, that's sanctification. Both Jesus who sanctifies and those who are sanctified, us, are all from one Father. It's all from one Father. For this reason, he's not ashamed to call us, brothers and sisters, brethren, part of his brotherhood, his family, if you would, saying, I will declare the Father's name, your name, to my brethren. Will you be called and considered to be Christ's brothers and sisters? 
In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your name. And again, he says, my trust and confident hope will be placed in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. You know, in the time when he was taking the bread and wine, you know, he, he said, you know, you know, Jesus in his prayer says, you know, you've given me these men and I've not lost one except the son of perdition, Judas. Here am I and the children whom God has given me. Let's go to Isaiah. We, you know, this is quoted. I, I believe, you know, it's, it's quoted here in Hebrews from Isaiah chapter 8, the prophet Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 12. And I'll read this in the, uh, the culture translation. Isaiah 8, and we'll start in verse 12. Do not say a conspiracy to everything which this people says. A conspiracy! And do not fear their fear, nor be afraid. When we're fearful, when we're fearful, we stop thinking logically. I had an incident just yesterday. I was uh, going down to our little local bakery to buy some sourdough bread for Sabbath. And this fellow, you know, I, they, they have this rule and post it on their window. Only one person in the shop allowed it once. It's a small shop, but, the, you know, the owner is has been very, you know, COVID crazy, you know, from the very beginning. And, well, I, I peeked in. There was somebody in there. I peeked in and said, oh, well, there's some two-day-old bread, which is 50% off. You know, I'm trying to economize, you know. As you know, food is rising in price and everything's getting much more expensive. And so I was sitting there and waiting outside the door while the, the person before me was finishing up their business. And this guy comes up behind me and I look at him. He's, oh, he's about my age, whatever. And he was angry. I could see it on his face. And he said, you know, because I said there was somebody in there and whatever we had, you know. And he, and he was I was so angry at all this COVID. And I, I, you know, and I said, you know, I'll be just a moment. And I went in and got my bread and I came out and said to him, it's, don't be angry. And I got close to him and I said, don't be angry with these people. You see, when they're fearful. And when you're, the people are fearful, they stop thinking logically. They've got to let the fear drain from them. And God says to us, you know, don't say a conspiracy to everything of which this people says a conspiracy and do not fear their fear, nor be afraid. The Lord of hosts, him shall you sanctify and let him be your fear, let him be your dread and he shall be a sanctuary for you. But a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel so oh, here are the people who were original children of the, of the old covenant, you know, the northern ten tribes who were separated, and eventually ended up in northwestern Europe. And you can find out a little more of this on our website. And then you had, of course, the children of Judah, who had this whole experience of being taken to Babylon and coming back, and then being, you know, you know, crushed by the Romans and all this sort of stuff. But he shall be a sanctuary for you, the Lord of hosts, Yahweh, the one Jesus said, you know, before Abraham was, I am, who I, he identified himself specifically in the Gospel of John as being the Lord of hosts, but that's what's written. A lot of people have that hard time accepting that. But for a stone of stumbling and rock of offense to both houses of Israel and for a trap and snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. And then verse 16, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. The testimony of Jesus Christ that was given in the gospel, the testimony of the disciples who that they wrote when they became apostles. The letters, apostle Paul and all the rest. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. See, the church of God is not an antinomian. We don't make all sorts of excuses why we don't keep the law of God. You know, we don't come up with a system of meaningless grace where, you know, do as you please and God forgives it all and whatever. You don't have to listen to God. You don't have to repent of your sins. You don't have to do any of this stuff. That's ridiculous. 
It's a lie. Don't be taken in. Don't be a sucker. Line up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. And I will wait upon the Lord who hides his face from the house of Jacob. I will trust in him. God is hiding his face from all these people who for centuries said, you know, they were worshiping him here in North America. God is hiding his face. That's not a good thing. Things are getting tough. But he, but, you know, he said, Isaiah was prophesying here that, but, but God's people, his disciples, I will trust in him. Verse 18, then, behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me. Think about this. This is the Lord of hosts speaking. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me, God the Father, are for wonders in Israel and from the Lord of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. Verse 20, to the law and the testimony if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. This is a critical scripture. When people come <clears throat> to me and say, well, what do you think of this person and whatever? He has these other good teachings. Does he keep the Sabbath? It's, 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 it's a test commandment. Does he keep the Sabbath? No, they don't speak according to God's word. Do they hold up God's law? His, his statutes, his ordinances, as a standard of, of between what is right and wrong, what is sinful and what is not sinful, so we don't have to continue to live in sin. Do they do that? They do not speak according to this word, it's because there is no light in them. And they shall pass through the land hard pressed and hungry, and it shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry, they shall rave and curse their king and their God. Whatever, you know, their idolatrous substitution is for the scriptural, the biblical God and what he teaches and who he is and what he represents. But then it says, and look upward, you know, they, maybe, they, there, maybe, there is, maybe there's something that I've been missing here. <clears throat> Perhaps looking for help from the real God whom they've ignored. And they shall look to the land and behold trouble and darkness and gloom of anguish, and they shall be driven away in darkness. We don't want to be people in whom there is no light. There's coming a difficult time. We're entering into it. We have to keep these things in mind. Let's go back to Hebrews 2, verse 14. Therefore, since these, his children, share in flesh and blood, you know, the physical nature <laughs> of what it is like to be a mortal being. He himself, in a similar manner, as Jesus Christ, also shared in the same physical nature, but, of course, without sin. So that th through experiencing death, he might make powerless, that is, ineffective, impotent, him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. You see, it goes all the way back from the very beginning of what Satan did to humanity in deceiving Eve and Adam. Verse 15, And that he might free all those who through the haunting fear of death were held in slavery throughout their lives. Because we know we have a promise. <clears throat> we know we're just mortal physical beings. We will die some point in time if time goes on. To come will come to each of us, but we can't be. We're not in the haunting fear of death because we know we have God's promises. Verse sixteen. For as we all know, he he <coughs> that is Jesus Christ doesn't take hold of fallen angels to give them a helping hand, but he does take hold of the fallen descendants of Abraham. This is the amplified version here. That is extending to them his hand of deliverance. Who are the sons of Abraham? You know, scripturally speaking, who are the sons? Is it just the Jews? See, a lot of Christians don't know this. Mainstream Christians are ignorant of this. Galatians 3.29. Who are the descendants of Abraham? Galatians 3.29. I'll cite this in the King James Version. You know, good old-fashioned King James. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to 
the promise. That's pretty clear. Pretty direct. Verse 17. Therefore, it was essential that he, that is Jesus Christ, had to be made like his brothers. The word here in Strong's is Strong's 80, Adelphos, a brother. Which, as the lexicon notes, is, can be also a member of the same religious community, a fellow Christian. But it, it, it is a, also a brother, a physical brother or sister. See, we have this uh, opportunity to minister in our own families. We all have that opportunity. So therefore, it was essential for him, verse 17, that he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might, by this experience as a human being, become a merciful and faithful high priest in things related to God to make atonement, that is, to be on a propitiation, the satisfaction for the people's sins. Because, you know, God had to make an atonement. It was the shed blood of Christ which wipes away our sins and satisfies divine justice, providing a, a way of reconciliation between God and ourselves. Humanity, all those who will turn to God. Because he himself, that is Jesus Christ in his humanity, has suffered being tempted. He was tried. He was tested by the devil, by his adversaries who were constantly harping on him, trying to catch him. And then, you know, at his trial, unjustly trying him, convicting him, murdering him after beating the daylights out of him, torturing him. Because he himself has suffered in being tempted. What, is, what does it say? He is able to help and provide immediate assistance to those who are being tempted and exposed to suffering. See, because Christ went through this experience, <clears throat> he's able to be that faithful high priest. If we go through suffering and we're doing these things, it is perhaps perfecting us for a future time when we, in our role of priest, are going to be able to help others because we will know it in depth. See, the things we go through and we learn in this life are to help others in the future. I mean, this is a promise. We are going to be kings and priests or kingly priests. In the service of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, this is in the kingdom of God. This is what is promised and prophesied. So there, there, you know, there's a positive result to whatever our trials and sufferings are that we're exposed to in this life. We just have to have persistence and perseverance. Remain faithful to the end. Let's go back here and, and, you know, and sum this up. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10. I'm going to read it in the New Living Translation this time. Hebrews 2 and verse 10. God, for whom and through whom everything was made, chose to bring many children into glory. And it was only right that he should make Jesus, through his suffering, a perfect leader, a champion, fit to bring them into their salvation. So now Jesus and the ones he makes holy have the same Father. This is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters. For he said to God, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you among your assembled people. There's something to think about as we approach the Christian Passover, as we wash each other's feet in Passover service and take the wine and bread in remembrance of the suffering and death and the price that was paid by the captain of our salvation, our elder brother, Jesus Christ, for, that was done for our salvation and for our good. So let's remember that as we approach 
This most solemn of ceremonies is coming Thursday evening. Till then, this coming Thursday evening, we'll be back on uh, around just around sunset, eight o'clock, and we'll look forward to being together again. Till then. <laughs>